Let me have you turn in your Bibles to James chapter 1 as we continue on in our study. If you're using a pew Bible, you'll find that on page 1386. James chapter 1. Going to begin the reading this morning in uh, verse 12 to put our text in context, and we're focusing particularly today on verses 21 through 27. And we'll see how far we get in that passage today, but James chapter 1, follow along as I read starting with verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was." But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Let's pray. Our Father God, we pray that you would minister these ancient words to our hearts, and that Holy Spirit, you would do what you were sent to do, to show us the Lord Jesus Christ, to help bring about conviction of sin in our own hearts and lead us to confess it and repent of it and forsake it. To remind us of what we have in the person and work of Christ, that those of us who have trusted in Him are completely clothed in His righteousness and washed clean of our filthy sin. We pray, Holy Spirit, that You would show us more and more how these truths impact how we think, and the way that we live. And particularly today, we pray, Lord, we pray that you would convict us if we are guilty of hypocrisy or if there are those who are deceived about their faith. We pray, Lord, that you'd be merciful to show us that and to draw us to the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Well, there's a popular slogan in Protestant Christianity probably a bumper sticker, I think, as well, it says something like this. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. I thought you might know that one. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. And because so many people claim allegiance to a particular religion or denomination, but then they don't necessarily live lives that match the teachings of Jesus, people have become disillusioned with that version of Christianity and rightfully so. But the word religion in our text really just carries the basic meaning of the outward observances of worship. So it's helpful for us to make some distinctions, for us to ask some questions. Is it wrong to participate in the outward observances of worship? 
like congregational singing or baptism or the Lord's Supper? Well, of course those things aren't wrong. God himself instituted them and told us that this is how he wants to be worshipped. The problem comes when some go through those outward observances of worship and there's not a matching inner reality. The problem is with those who observe the rituals of outward worship without a matching inner spirit of humble reverence and devotion toward God. It's kind of like the description of the Pharisees. You know, the heart of hypocrisy is drawing near to God with our lips, but remaining far from Him in our hearts. So today, let's listen to James teach us about the essence of pure religion. Pure religion, that's the good kind where what we do outwardly and the singing and the praying and the baptism and the Lord's table and the preaching of the Word and the reading of the Word, and all of those things that we do outwardly, the essence of pure religion is that the in of, inside of us, our hearts match what we're doing on the outside and with sincerity or wholeness of being or without hypocrisy, we worship the Lord Now, we've been talking about trials in the book of James, haven't we? Intense trials. People oppressing other people and making their lives really difficult. What are some of the responses of unbelief that we've talked about that tempt us when we're going through difficult trials like the recipients of James's letter? Well, some of those responses of unbelief have included believing inaccurate things about God. You know, like... God's not really all good, or he's not really all wise, or he can't possibly be all sovereign. Sometimes we're even tempted to blame our temptation to sin upon God. That's why James so clearly addresses that in this first chapter. I keep having this phrase come to mind, the the, the phrase, cast aspersions. Kids, what that means is, It's the idea of hurling criticisms against God that are not true. And we probably wouldn't verbalize those things. You know, we wouldn't say them because we know better than that. But in our hearts, that's often what we're doing when we respond to trials in unbelief. Sometimes a response of unbelief includes a response of wrath or sinful anger because we really don't like what God is allowing. We really don't care for that providence. And so James addresses some of these hard issues in responding to difficult trials. Now, practically speaking, as we've seen, we tend to justify sin because of the trial. You know, I deserve this pleasure even if it breaks God's law. And we find ourselves looking for comfort in things, all sorts of things, all sorts of places instead of in Christ. Think about it. Have you ever been tempted along any of these lines? I'm really struggling today, so this extra helping of food or this ice cream cone will make me feel really good. I had the most horrible day at work, so I deserve to get drunk. Being poor has ruined my life, so my one dominating goal from here forward is going to be to make money. I'm so sick of being taken advantage of, so more than anything else, I'm going to demand respect and make others do my bidding. The stress of my schedule has been so intense I deserve to binge watch my show, even if it means missing church and missing showering and other basic hygiene. Do you think the recipients of James's letter would have had their own struggle in responding to difficult trials? Living in a land that was really not the land of their origin, where the language and the culture and so many things were different, And the people, in in the context of those who were receiving this from James, there were those who were rich and powerful, seemingly even from their own people, who were lording it over them, oppressing them, making life very difficult for them. You think they would have had their own struggles in responding? Does it make sense why James says some of the things that he says? Everything from doubting God 
to looking for their greatest comfort in the things of the world. Well, James, in this first chapter, is teaching us to, to live in a godly fashion even in the midst of those trials. And that includes having right thoughts toward God, having our thinking straight and our theology straight, but it also includes not allowing the trial to justify our sin. And someone who loves God with all of his heart and who loves his neighbor as himself will continue to live righteously even while enduring trials. And that can be a challenge. There are a number of reasons for that. We've already mentioned some of the temptations um, that are a part of those trials, but sometimes it can even be more subtle. You may not even notice, but as you endure certain trials, and, and this is kind of subtle, but it's real, they can have a tendency to just make us slowly start turning inward and quit serving others. Have you ever gone through a really difficult time and then all of a sudden had that awareness about yourself? That you're not really thinking about others or serving others or having any kind of an outward outlook? And there are some legitimate reasons why that can happen. Sometimes we can't help our abilities to serve others to a certain extent. You know, if I'm lying in a hospital bed, my ability to serve others has certainly changed. Maybe I'm able to pray, but some of those other things that I used to do, or at least right now temporarily, I can't do. But trials can get us to thinking about ourselves, sometimes wallowing in our pain, feeling sorry for ourselves, and becoming consumed with our own situation. And we can become pretty self-centered without even thinking about it. That's why I think some of the best advice when they're in the midst of a trial is to discipline ourselves to proactively look out and think of others and see how we can minister to others even in the midst of our own storm. Sometimes as a part of God's means to help us through that storm, to have a heart to see others even in the midst of our own trials. Well, what are some practical ways that James um, instructs for Christ followers to think and act as we continue through a life often fraught with trials? Kids, the word fraught just means full of. It usually has a negative feel to it. So when we talk about a life fraught with trials, we're talking about a life that is full of trials. And that is what it is like oftentimes living in a fallen world. Maybe some of you haven't noticed it as much yet. Praise God for that. But as you grow up and experience things, you'll realize that this is not the end of all things. And praise God for that. So James, I think, mentions a number of things to us here in our text to help us how to think and how to live and how to respond even in the midst of these trials. Um, number one, I'll just say this, continue putting off and putting on. Are you familiar with that principle? I mean, it's in Romans, it's in Colossians, it's in Ephesians. It's taught a great deal by the Lord Jesus and by the Apostle Paul. The principle of putting off and putting on. Uh, in verse 21 of our text, James says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And it sounds a lot like, what we're told in Romans 13, 13 and 14. I'll just summarize some of this. Put off revelry and drunkenness, lewdness and lust, strife and envy. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. Put off the old man which grows corrupt. Put on the new man which was created according to God. Colossians 3, 8 and 12. Put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. And so James, in a way that is in line with the teaching of the Apostle Paul and the Lord Jesus Christ, essentially tells us here to continue putting off and putting on. Put off filthiness, and overflow of wickedness, put off those influences that are all around us, put off those natural responses of unbelief in the midst of a trial where we cast aspersions against God, cast off those things, put them off, 
and put on the humility of receiving the implanted word. James paints a word picture here. The implanted word sounds a lot like a a seed or something that you would put in the ground, doesn't it? The implanted word is the message of salvation that has taken root in their souls. And it kind of reminds us of the parable of the four soils, doesn't it? Because the word goes forth, and we know that the word is living and powerful, but there's also a responsibility of human stewardship and how that is received. And so Jesus teaches the parable of the four soils where people can hear the word and there even seems to be a response, but it's only the fertile soil that bears fruit that actually receives the word. And so there's kind of a a warning here to think about how we receive the implanted word. That plant needs diligent care so that it thrives within us and doesn't just shrivel up and die. Think about uh, the various responses that some of us have to plants that come into the house. Some of us do really well with them, and we might have quite a few of them, and the right answer as to the right number of plants in a house is just one more. But then there are some of us where a plant comes into the house, and we step back with eyes slightly open saying, I'm afraid you're going to die. (laughs) My record on these things is not strong. Well, we, in receiving the implanted word, are to put off filthiness and rampant wickedness or put off moral filth. These are broad terms. Evil that is so prevalent and to humbly receive that word. And where it is our human responsibility, provide an environment for that humble reception. How do we do that? Well, it's really an issue of the heart and of the mind, isn't it? I thought of an illustration. A few weeks ago, I mentioned to to you from the pulpit some of my ongoing health issues that I was struggling with. And one of my key concerns is that there are lab tests that have shown that I have a significant amount of pesticides in my body, and my body is having a hard time detoxifying those substances. So think about that scenario. You have chemicals that are designed to kill weeds that are dumped out on the crops in some way, producing essentially a toxic environment. Then the plants take in those chemicals, so internally you could say they are now essentially poisoned. not trying to be political here. I'm just saying it as I understand it. And then those plants have a profound impact on those who consume them. I'm just speaking from personal experience. Now, spiritually speaking, I think our hearts are affected in a similar way. We can allow the filth of this world to have way too much influence on us, and a lot of that is a choice. The toxic environment of godless philosophies and values and actions can greatly impact us. And then our minds end up becoming more conformed to this world And we begin thinking like the world thinks, loving the things that the world loves, and doing the things that they do. And you could call that internal filth, as it makes its way into our minds and hearts. Well, then our actions can often have a profound impact on those around us as our thoughts become words and deeds. And you could call that external filth. That's why James says to put off all of this Phil. It has to do with what we allow ourselves to be surrounded by and influenced by, what we allow to seep into our hearts and minds, and then how it comes out and affects others in our words and in our deeds. And James says this filthiness is to be laid aside. That's the put off principle. We are to put on all of those things which will cause the implanted word to grow and flourish. Like looking to Christ as our righteousness and our motivation for godly living, remembering the cleansing of our sin and the robes of righteousness that clothe us because of His work on our behalf, 
filling our minds with godly and wholesome things, Philippians 4.8. Being transformed by the renewing of our minds according to the word of God and cultivating hearts that overflow with actions of love and words of peace. James says, Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And we're not just talking here about, you know, we talk about the idea of like getting saved or being saved, and we're often referring to our conversion when we come to faith in Christ. But this word actually is much broader than that. This word, you know, when, when James says this, the implanted word is able to save your souls, he's talking about having a wholeness of life. He's talking about being restored, not simply the act of conversion. So the word of God does not just save us from sin and hell. It makes us whole and complete in really every aspect of life. And so when we talk about abundant life, when we talk about everlasting life, we're talking about a quality of life that not only saves us from sin, but transforms us in every aspect. And so, James says, continue, continue on, putting off and putting on. Number two, James says, continue doing after hearing. Make this a lifestyle. Make this the way you roll, that you hear the word and then you do the word. You're not just a hearer only, but you're a hearer and a doer. Look at verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. We've already said this sounds a lot like Jesus' teaching, things that he said in the Sermon on the Mount or the parable of the sower. There is a, a very real possibility that we can deceive ourselves, and it's dangerous for us to be spiritually deceived. If you hear the word, but you don't do it, James says, you're deceiving yourself concerning your actual interest in following Jesus. So, a simple question, but so important, do we practice what we hear? Are we bearing fruit? And this deception is also dangerous because true disciples of Jesus can deceive themselves for periods of time and cause damage to their souls and their walk with Christ. We should never be satisfied simply because we're in church and someone is preaching. It has to go beyond that. So one of the things I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is we need to reject that mentality that is quite American in some ways. It certainly is a part of our culture where we participate in worship more like a consumer. Like, I'm going to sit back, I'm going to take what I like out of this, critique what's going on, and if it, does, you know, if it doesn't give me what I want, make me feel the way I want, you know, I'll try somewhere else. Well, there are certainly things to keep in mind when you're looking for a good church, and there can be, uh, come a time to leave a church. But we can have this attitude where, well, what's going on up there, up here, you know, up on this stage, uh, I'm going to kind of settle back in and, and just kind of see what they're doing up there. And, um, you know, if something kind of strikes me, um, you know, I'll, I'll think a little bit about it. But what God wants from us when his word is being preached I think that there are elements of this as well when we have our time with the Lord, you know, when we have that personal interaction with the Lord as well. He wants us to cultivate the, the heart and the discipline of being doers of the word where we're actively involved in pursuing Christ, not just sitting back watching a show. He uses this analogy. The forgetful hearer is like a person looking into a mirror. Now, it's been a while, but we, I actually preached through this passage years ago. I don't know if you remember it, but um, it, it's helpful for us to 
have a little bit of an understanding for what mirrors were like in the day of James, and that helps us to understand what he's saying. The mirrors in his day were really more like polished metal. Have you ever been to a, a bathroom at a park, and maybe they had metal mirrors, and they're not really that great, but at least they can't be vandalized as easily? Um, but they're a little, a little distorted. Well, in James's day, they would lay a mirror like that horizontally on a table, and that's why James talks about looking into them. So we're not talking about some Disney thing like mirror, mirror on the wall, you know, like there's something back in there I'm going to look into. No, it's the idea is that a, a metal, polished metal mirror would lie on a, on a flat surface and then someone would have to look into it. And that's why James uses that terminology. The view wasn't particularly great, even if you were good looking. And when you walked away, there was a tendency to immediately forget what you saw. Now, we have much better mirrors, and we still contend to do that. You know, like a, a tendency to reinterpret what you saw. For some of us, we probably remember ourselves as we were at a younger, better-looking period in life. And uh, sometimes we walk by a mirror and we're like, oh, whoa. And it's a kind of a blessed privilege to walk away and... Think back to other days when that was not the reality. Well, James says it's possible for people to look into a mirror like that, walk away, and pretty much forget what you just saw. And I think when it comes to the preaching of the Word or our time with the Word, it's possible for us to get excited about what a speaker is saying. Maybe there was somebody who was particularly um, good in chapel on a particular day and caught our attention more than normal and was easy to listen to. At certain times we encounter the preaching of the Word and we can get stirred up for different reasons, but really, we're talking about cultivating the heart and the discipline to regularly respond to what is said regardless of the vehicle bringing it. You know, regardless of who's preaching, regardless of how we're interacting with it. It's possible for us to get excited, and then, you know, later on that night, we can pretty much completely forget everything that we heard, and it can have very little lasting impact on our lives. James says, contrasted with that, the doer of the word continues to look into the perfect law of liberty. And this encompasses a lot, right? It encompasses certainly the preaching of the Word and the hearing of the Word, but it also would take in our private time with the Word or pretty much any way we can encounter it and a faithful explanation of it. And James says if we continue to kind of take the Word with us and we're constantly looking into it, maybe more like a you know, pocket mirror or something, you know, we, we are bringing that accurate reflection with us all the time, the view is accurate, and we don't be, stay satisfied just being a hearer of the word. The doer is continually looking. And in doing so, is consistently confronted with both the nastiness of my own sin that remains, as well as the glorious righteousness of Jesus Christ that makes us acceptable to the Father and allows me to have access to a thrice holy God. We learn to hate our sin more. We learn to love the Lord Jesus Christ more. But this only happens when we're regularly engaged in the Word. We don't walk away from the Word, so to speak, but continue to look intently into it. And James says this is actually a life of blessing and safety. Not because we're earning something by our good works, but because fellowship with God and obedience to God bring peace and joy to our often chaotic lives. Some of you have heard me use this analogy before, but do you remember the, uh, the illustration of the, the two-year-old in the backyard of a house? Now, some people might say, especially that two-year-old might say, I don't like these fences. I don't like these constrictions. I want to go outside of these fences and do something because I'm sure it's far more exciting out there. Well, playing within the confines of the fence is a safe and happy experience for most two-year-olds in the backyard. 
But leaving the yard and going out into the street could bring danger and even death with vehicles coming by. Well, God's law, God's word, we could say, is a law of liberty because first, Jesus has perfectly obeyed the law for us on our behalf, and second, because as we obey the law out of love for God, we have liberty and freedom from sin's condemnation and from sin's consequences. So James says, this one will be blessed in what he does. And of course, this blessing doesn't automatically guarantee perfect health and boatloads of money. But it does mean, this kind of blessing does mean the forgiveness of sins, a clean conscience, fellowship with faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, the possibility of great joy in the midst of life's sorrows, and the assurance of eternity with Christ. This man, this woman, this child of God will indeed be blessed as they regularly engage the Word of God, they cultivate the discipline of being a doer of the Word and not a hearer only. That person will be blessed. And it's clear from the Word that our constant attachment to the Word that has been implanted in us is absolutely crucial to our walk with God. We are to humbly receive the implanted word. So what are some practical ways we can do this? If our attachment to the word is essential for loving Christ, how do we relate the doing to the hearing? Well, some of you, I think, probably will remember hearing this. It's been a few years ago now when I just preached a a passage or two from James, but I think that these applications are still relevant. I want to give them to you again. For some, of course, they'll be new. But when we're listening to the Word of God in public, and I would say, you know, these principles can apply to our private time as well, but when we listen to the Word of God in public, here are some things I want to challenge you with, okay? I'm going to give you five practical steps, and it's going to be somewhat related to food that can stick out in our minds, especially at noon on a Sunday. Number one, how can I be a a doer of the word and not a hearer only? Come hungry. Come hungry. You know, there's nothing worse than going to a wonderful meal and you just ate an hour and a half earlier and you didn't realize and you're full of all kinds of stuff and you just can't appreciate it. Come hungry. Come with a heart of humility, a heart of prayer, a heart of receptivity. Reject the the typical passive method of listening to the Word. Now, and here's what this looks like, okay? The passive method of listening to the Word is, well, I'm going to come and listen to what this guy is saying, so maybe later on I can debate it with my friends, or maybe it's going to be something interesting, and I can kind of say, you know, I never knew that before, because I love learning new things, or for some people, just simply, when is the guy going to be done? Reject those kinds of things and come hungry. Have a big appetite for God's Word, and if you don't feel like you have that, ask Him for it. God invites us to ask Him for things related to a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Ask him. Number one, come hungry. Number two, eat until you're full. Have this idea, I'm coming for something good to eat, and I'm not leaving without it. And if the preacher is just being faithful, maybe not even outstanding, but if he's just being faithful, then a large portion of this task is up to me, you know, the listener, the hearer. If the preacher is just trying to be faithful, if what is being preached is orthodox, if Jesus is being faithfully put out to the people, then I am not leaving without something to eat. So think of this process as a two-way street. You could say, in a sense, the preacher's job is to set out the food. But it's up to you to go and get it and eat it. Have the attitude, I'm not going to just sit here passively waiting for the speaker to stir me up. 
I'm going to come stirred up, waiting for what the Lord has for me today. I'm coming in, and my eyes are open, and I'm leaning forward, and I'm listening for what the Lord has for me through his word today, and I'm not satisfied until I have something to help fill my mind and change my life and show me the Lord in a way that I needed to have today. Maintain a spirit of submission. Now, we don't really verbalize these things in our church a whole lot, but in our hearts at least, have a spirit that says, Amen, I agree, keep teaching me, Lord. Holy Spirit, give me a passion for your truth. I'm not going home hungry. Number three, take some home with you. Now, this might look different for different people. Maybe some of you will take traditional notes, and that's how you listen well, and it will help you remember it later, and and that's how you take it home. Some of you might decide you're going to just jot down some key truths, some key thoughts, maybe one application in your Bible or something. Some of you, maybe it's just a matter of zoning in on something and then praying through it, asking the Lord to help you to take that truth home. But make sure that you have a styrofoam carryout box as you leave. The other night, Melissa and I uh, went to Taste of Jerusalem up there by Meyer, And uh, as we were eating our food, you could tell there was a lot of chaos going on in the back. I don't know who was making the mistakes, but it was chaotic. And I think some of them were related because they were kind of interacting like brothers and sisters. And um, it was kind of entertaining and, you know, slightly annoying. And, uh, but what happened, what we got out of it is a, a, a girl comes out and she's basically saying, who wants a plate of lamb? <laughs> she's, she's like, we made a mistake. Who wants some lamb? Anybody want some lamb? So we look at each other. We're already eating our food, but we're like, well, you know, I mean, here she's offering it to us. And, and so, so we got a third meal and uh, tasted it a bit and put it in a styrofoam box and took it home. Take home something to meditate on. You know what meditate means? It means to think about it until it becomes a part of you and changes your life. Chew on it. Think about it. Pray about it. Ask God to show you what it means to live it. And don't uh, give up until it becomes a part of your life. And I've said in the past, and I'll say it again, we do this in other areas. How many of you have had to study for something in the last year or two, and you just you had to go over it and go over it until it became a part of your thinking, especially if you're going to go do a vocation and have to cultivate a skill related to that? Some stuff we study for a test, right? It's like, nah, 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 nah. okay, take the test, never remember it again. But there are some things, please, please, those of you who are going to be like nurses and doctors, learn it well, okay? <laughs> Let it become a part of you, please. Well, we do that, don't we? Surgeons have to do that. Teachers, engineers, we have to learn something and mull it over and continue interacting with it until it kind of just becomes a part of who we are. Well, believers should hear the truth, meditate on the truth, take it home and think about it more, crack open that clamshell a little bit later when we're hungry again, and practice that until it becomes habitual for us to walk with God. Number five, compliment the chef. That's not me. Who I'm really talking about here is the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Compliment the chef, what I mean is thank God for his word. Worship him by thanking him for the word that has been set before you and thank him for faithful preachers and pastors and teachers and moms and dads who continue to set it before you day in, day out, week in, week out. And remember that even as we do these practical things, this is all to be done in in Christ's strength and for Him and with Him as our motivation. And if we focus on doing without focusing on Christ, we can quickly become pharisaical. Did you hear that? If we focus on doing without focusing on Jesus, we can quickly become pharisaical and again, drawing near to him with our lips and having our hearts be far from him. So in the midst of the doing, remember that Jesus is central to all of this. Ask the Holy Spirit as we sang, change me, mold me, 
minister to me this word. And we can find ourselves being doers of the word and not hearers only. And then, more briefly, the the third thing that James says to us, he says, continue putting off and putting on, continue doing after hearing, and then continue cultivating an inward heart that matches your outward profession. Look at verse 26. Now, sometimes when we get to this passage, you know, we might have a message on, you know, caring for widows and orphans. But actually, in this passage, James is taking something fairly common and using it as an illustration. Look at verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. You think you're religious because you made a profession of faith? You go to church? You participate in the worship rituals of Christianity and you outwardly obey the letter of the law? I mean, you haven't killed anyone. But James teaches the same inward religion that Jesus does. Our outward actions and words come from our hearts, and our hearts must be addressed so that our actions and words are pure and undefiled or untainted and unmixed. We're not characterized by unconfessed hypocrisy. And so James lays out three brief examples of what it means to cultivate the inward heart that matches the outward profession. He gives an example, he gives really three examples of what pure religion is. Number one, bridling the tongue. There are a lot of sins of the tongue. We're not doing a topical study on the tongue this morning, but there are a lot of sins of the tongue. We know what a lot of them are, don't we? Lying, cursing, taking the Lord's name in vain. Slander, where we say bad things about someone even if it's not true. Sexual innuendo. Proud, destructive criticism. Angry outbursts, which he's really already mentioned here recently in the text. Angry outbursts toward God and toward man. Those are some. James says... If you think you're religious, but you don't bridle your tongue, you're deceived. Just pure religion, unmixed religion, religion of the heart, true worship, a life of true worship in the heart and in the outward actions, means that you're going to be putting on the Lord Jesus Christ where it comes to your speech. So that's a good test for us, isn't it? We're not going to do it perfectly. But what is the trajectory of your life where that is concerned? Are you striving by God's grace to bring your tongue into submission to God's word and under the influence of the Holy Spirit, living after the Spirit and not living after the flesh? And when we do sin in that way, are we becoming aware of that, confessing of it and turning from it as it happens? He gives a second example. Ministering to the vulnerable. When James talks about visiting orphans and widows and their trouble, he doesn't just mean go and see how they're doing. He means to look after them, to take care of them. That's what the word visit means there. To look after them and to take care of them. Uh, Orphans and widows throughout history have often been particularly vulnerable because in a lot of societies and in a lot of cultures, they wouldn't have insurance like we know it or government programs, or a guardian or a provider. And so they were considered to be at risk. They were considered to be vulnerable because they didn't have the protections, which oftentimes in those societies meant a husband or a father or someone who would earn a living and protect them and take care of them and make sure they weren't taken advantage of. And so when James says to visit the orphans and widows in their trouble, He's not talking about some grand and glorious program. He's talking about every day all around us we see people who are being taken advantage of or people who are at risk. And in this particular scenario, the the common uh, demographic that really needed attention was women whose husbands had passed away and children whose parents had passed away or whatever practical equivalent. They didn't have parents. 
for all practical purposes, and a woman who no longer had a husband. And they were considered to be at risk. So throughout scriptures, without we're not going to take a lot of time with this this morning, but you could, in a sense, say that God himself took on the role of their protector. I mean, you can see throughout Scripture that God has a special place in his heart for widows and orphans. And in a sense, he would take upon himself the role of their protector. And I think you could see him using his people to be the protectors and the providers for those who didn't have any as far as the things of this world are concerned. Another reason that this is a test of true religion is that this is not one of those things where you would naturally get a lot in return. Now, in the context of the book of James, there were rich and powerful people who had a lot of influence, and as we'll see later on in the book, um, giving favoritism to certain ones was a huge problem. We favor those who have riches and power and the ability to do something for us. And what James is saying here is that we don't minister to others because of what they can do for us. We minister, as we love God with all of our hearts and love our neighbors as ourselves, we minister because that's what the heart of Christ would lead us to do and because they need it, not because of what it will do for us. Not for the glory, not for the prestige, not because it will further our career, not because it will pad our pockets, and by the way, it makes us think too, doesn't it, that if we're going to minister to those like widows and orphans or those who are vulnerable, is it really something we need to video and put on YouTube or Insta if we're going to minister to those who are especially vulnerable in the heart that James tells us to have in doing so? Does that fit? Well, maybe you could convince me there's a place for that, but... I would wonder what, at least we'd have to ask, what is our heart if we feel like our good works need to be seen before men? So God's people have an opportunity to show God's love and the love of Christian family to those who are oppressed. We look after orphans and widows in their trouble and in their distress. We take up the role of guardian and provider. We alleviate their needs. We put the love of God into action with our words and our deeds. And, and this could look very different for different people. I, I, my purpose this morning is not to guilt everyone into doing more or, you know, officially go into some kind of program or something. Just address the needs God providentially puts in your path. Start there. We don't need to develop false guilt over this issue. If some of us are truly being convicted by the Lord for some reason, don't stifle that. But on the other hand, we don't need to, you know, accept false guilt either. So for some, it might mean things like adopting and fostering or taking part in a program like Safe Families. For others, it might mean we support people who do those things. It might mean that we try to minister as a church to some that the Lord brings our way in the community. It means getting to know the widows in our congregation. Taking a special interest in the kid across the street whose parents are divorcing or struggling with addiction. How about going and standing with an immigrant in the courtroom or helping a widower take care of his lawn or a widow with her taxes? We're not trying to saddle one another with specific duties to which we're not providentially called. We're not trying to fill one another's lives with guilt, frustration, and confusion with the, the mantra that's like, we always got to do more, I've always got to do more. But if we focus on loving others with the same love with which we've been loved, the applications are endless. And we can all do something without guilt and frustration and confusion. And James says... Uh, true religion will be illustrated by things like ministering to widows and orphans who really need help, who are vulnerable, who are typically afflicted. And just doing that as a part of the, the heart of the way we live is a sign of God's work in our lives as we humbly pursue those things. And then lastly, a third example he gives is keeping oneself unspotted from the world. And Really, it seems like that's a restatement of verse 21. 
It's another example of pure and undefiled religion, practicing godliness, pursuing holiness, keeping clear of that moral filth and wickedness so prevalent in the world, being careful to love what God loves and to not absorb the godless thinking and living of unbelievers. Now, it could be that uh, some of you this morning, if you don't know the Lord, my prayer is that maybe even just hearing this taught, maybe some of you need to come to terms with the fact that you have had maybe an outward form of Christianity without the inward reality. Now, that can happen a lot. I mean, it's taught, it's taught against in the Scriptures by the Lord Jesus Himself. It's possible for us to have the outward displays of religion without the inward reality of a love for God. And that's what James has been opening up some this morning. So maybe for some of you, you're raised in the church, you've heard these things all your life, but the question is, is there an internal reality to your walk with the Lord, or is it largely just a culture of Christianity that's been handed to you? Well, the good news is that the Lord Jesus stands ready to save. The Lord Jesus stands ready to save. And maybe it's time for some of you to confess your hypocrisy and repent of your deception. Repent of your Pharisaism where you've been satisfied to put on a show when you know deep in your heart you just don't have a love for God really at all. But the Lord Jesus stands ready to save, ready to forgive, just like all of us who know the Lord. And I would invite you to come. Come with that. Maybe you say, I've been... I've been hypocritical. I, I've been doing things I'm really embarrassed and ashamed to tell people because I've had this outward display of Christianity, but inside I have a heart that's filled with filth. You don't have to clean yourself up first. We're not taught, clean yourself up and then come to the Lord. We're taught, come, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Jesus invites us. But I would say it's time to come. If you've been a hearer of the word but not a doer, then come to him and ask him to help you, to forgive you of that sin and to turn from that and to become, because really, uh, really a doer of the word, you could say is another term for a true believer. A doer of the word, someone who hears it and then by God's grace does it out of love for God because that's a place of blessing and that brings honor to his name. We don't earn anything in our salvation, but living like this does show that we have been changed. And if that describes you this morning, I would encourage you, don't be satisfied with just this outward display. I mean, you're here again, you know, you're in the house of God, you're listening again. But this time, don't go home and go right back to that life of filth. Maybe you've hidden it. Maybe it's in your heart. Maybe it's in things most people can't see. But you know you're drawn to that and, you're, and that's what you really love. Today, don't go home and go back to that. Go home and ask the Holy Spirit to change your heart. Ask Him to cleanse you of that filth and to clothe you in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be a doer of the Word and not a hearer only deceiving our own selves. Well, may God bless the word of James and the word of the Lord to our hearts. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do thank you for your word. Lord, give us hearts that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Give us desires to hear from you and to not be satisfied without having something to go home with. Lord, help us to not be satisfied just going through the outward motions of Christian rituals. But Lord, cause our worship in our hearts to be that which is pure and unmixed. That what we do or profess on the outside is matched by a heart that loves the Lord our God with all of our heart. Lord, this really is a, a work of your grace, and so we ask that you would be gracious to us. For those of us who know you, Lord, we pray that you would encourage us to take up this challenge, to come hungry to hear from you, so that on a regular basis, Lord, your word becomes a part of that which transforms our minds and impacts our lives. We pray in Jesus' name.